Welcome to This Week in Politics here on KSFY. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Allen. We have a special episode of the program for you this evening featuring longtime Dakota News Now political analyst Dr. Jeff Stein. Coming up, we will be talking about the political future of South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and what Stein thinks about her continual denials of a White House run while actively visiting early presidential primary and caucus states like Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. But we begin this evening by talking about ongoing infrastructure negotiations in Washington and whether Stein thinks a real plan will survive this process or if the topic has become another game of political football. I think most people, as they hear all this talk about infrastructure, they're tuning it out because it's just so much noise. We know what infrastructure is, and that's the so-called hard infrastructure, when you have sort of a new definition of what infrastructure is, including paying people, human infrastructure. That takes it into a whole different direction, and there are a lot of people who are just, in essence, saying a pox on all your houses. We need infrastructure, but we don't have a trillion, much less $5 trillion that we can just borrow for it. So they're having a fight about the stuff they even can agree on, and that really turns off a lot of the public. It's sort of like, we'll believe it when we see it. We'll believe it when they do a ribbon cutting on that new bridge. Until then, it's just a lot of noise, and people are much more interested in going on family vacations to the Black Hills this time of year. You've got a lot of Democrats right now, Jeff, that are making the argument that things like expanding broadband into rural areas and providing more federal funding for child care, that those types of things should be considered infrastructure given the world we live in right now. Are they right? They certainly are about broadband for all areas. And if we learned anything through the pandemic, it was that even cities of some size did not have a robust enough pipe for all of the day that, that needed to be transmitted that data during school and workday. The pipes were getting pretty full. So just in the same way that roads were determined to be infrastructure 100 years ago, this is, as we used to call it, the information superhighway. That part people really get. You get a little fuzzier when you start talking about things that are not, shall we say, a little more permanent, like paying someone's wages, even though in order to get workers, you have to have child care. That's one of the number one impediments to growing a workforce. Yet there's still a lot of people who say that's not really infrastructure. It may need to be taken care of, but don't muddy the water by calling that human infrastructure infrastructure. I want to talk about wages for a second here. You know, during the height of the pandemic and actually even before that, uh, there was political debate about should the minimum wage be increased? Should people be able to make more money than, say, what they are now? One of the things that we're seeing right now as we come out of the pandemic, or we think we're coming out of the pandemic, is this idea of businesses having to pay higher wages in order to get people to come to work for them in the first place. Now, there's those who say that those higher wages undercut businesses. Is there any part of this that's good? Is there any part that businesses having to pay a higher wage does more for Americans and does more to expand the economy, bringing more people, in theory, out of the lower class and into the middle class? It all depends if this is government mandated through some sort of artificial minimum wage that is standardized across the country, despite the fact that it costs a lot less to live in some areas of a state than another much less parts of the country, or if it's happening organically as part of capitalism. So for example, where I am in Iowa, the cost of living is much lower than it is, say, in New York City. It does not make much sense to have a standard minimum wage for those very disparate parts of the country. If you say all of a sudden the minimum wage is now $15 an hour, nearly double what it is now, well, there are a lot of people making $15 an hour. They're not going to want to be thought of as minimum wage employees. And so, yes, you're raising up this certain level, but those who are making $15 an hour now are going to want $20 and $25. And so there's this huge domino effect if you make it mandated by the state or the federal government. If it's happening organically, then it's a matter of paying people what they're worth in the workplace, and it's more a matter of market forces. Now, it does mean that you're going to be paying people a lot more, arguably, than you might now, but if there's a worker shortage or if talented workers are in demand, that is going to happen. And then it tends to work itself out through the economy. 
That's why there are more people now than ever who say, forget about raising the minimum wage, get rid of the minimum wage because it's distracting us. It's taking us away from a conversation about regional economies and about actually having a pay scale that reflects the local or regional marketplace as opposed to some artificial number. Would regional economies, would looking at it that way though, isn't there an argument that that muddies the water because how many different ecosystems, economic systems, uh, should you have in one country floating about one to the next? Well, but again, the idea is if you have a standardized minimum wage across the country, it becomes irrelevant in certain parts of the country. It doesn't work in Los Angeles because it's too low and it might not work in Pierre because it's too high. And so if you just let market forces prevail, we already know now that they're having to close swimming pools because they can't find lifeguards, uh, the convenience stores. I never thought I'd see at a fast food restaurant, a convenience store, et cetera, a starting wage of $16 an hour plus a bonus of a week's pay as a signing incentive. But that's what they're having to pay to get people to work regardless of minimum wage. And so it's just more a matter of having the local markets dictate what's appropriate as opposed to being fixated on one number that as our larger cities get bigger and bigger, that one number just has no application in reality. Dakota News Now political analyst Dr. Jeff Stein joining us on This Week in Politics from his base of operations at KXEL Radio in Waterloo, Iowa. Jeff, there is a real political scrum underway right now concerning what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border. You have Republicans labeling this the Biden administration's problem 100 percent. You've got uh, social media hashtags out there that say Biden border crisis. This problem isn't new. It's not limited to the first of the year when Biden took office. This was a problem from the previous administration. What's the reality here? Like, how should we be looking at this? Because you've got Democrats against Republicans. And in the meantime, you've still got a problem at the border. You have a huge problem at the border. There are some Democrats in Texas in particular who are breaking from the administration because they see how this is impacting their local areas. In one respect, it was made a bit worse because those in other countries who wanted to come here said, look, a change in administration, that bodes well for us. And that may not be the case in terms of the actual administration position, but it's what they thought. And that's why there's this increasing surge. Here's the wild card on the whole thing. It's one thing to say we want to welcome people into this country, even those who don't follow the rules in terms of how to legally gain admittance. The wild card is COVID. What kind of testing is being done? It is hard for an administration to sell a COVID policy, for example, telling all of us we have to wear masks indoors when we have a flood of people coming across the border, not being tracked, not being tested, et cetera. And that then muddies the issue of the illegal immigration. Because again, you've got the administration wanting to talk about broad immigration policy, and you have others who say, well, there's a difference between immigration through proper channels and this illegal immigration. And then you throw again the idea of COVID. That's the real issue with citizens, Brian. One of the things that those who don't like seeing this influx, one of the things they like to say is there's drugs, there's human trafficking, et cetera. Probably meritorious, probably also not to the level they claim, but it's the COVID thing that dominates all of our public policy discussions, and that is hampering the Biden administration's effort to get something substantive done about the border, because again, there's that overlay of COVID, and that's a full-time job handling that, not only in Washington, but around our kitchen tables as well. Do we go do an event? Do we get the shot? Do we not? Do we mask? That's the discussion we're still having now, a year and a half into this. And expanding on that for a second, that idea of COVID policy, and I'm not sure where I want to go here, but I think the question that I want to ask you is this. We're hearing from so many elected officials who are saying, you know what, uh, even with the Delta variant rearing its ugly head, we're not going to put mass mandates in place. We're not going to shut down. We're not going to act or react to the extent that we did when this pandemic was fresh and new 16, 18 months ago. Those same elected leaders will also say that one of the reasons that they don't want to do that 
uh, is because people are just tired of this. They're emotionally drained. They're tired of having to quarantine. They're tired of being told wear a mask. They're tired of being told that they can't do things that they want to do. And while that is totally understandable, is it that type of thinking, Jeff, that should be making policy? If the public, Brian, doesn't buy into the policy, does not support it, does not believe it, it's not going to be successful. And so there is a balance. And so it is up to the elected officials if they want to impose mask mandates, limitations on business, they're going to have to do a better job now of justifying why. Everybody gave grace a year ago because it was new. So now you have enough data out there, you have enough treatment in addition to the preventatives of vaccinations that these elected officials are going to have to justify why they want to do what they do. You'll recall this month when the CDC said, we think now the mask mandates should be back in place. We're gonna change our recommendation on masks. And the first question that people asked was why? What changed? What data is there? So we're becoming more sophisticated in governing our own actions. And we're going to expect these elected officials, if they're going to do things that limit commerce or liberty, well, we just want to know what the information is. Because I think people have been 